I told Rob and Kim that I would be no longer than two hours today, so you guys hold me to that, all right? <laughs> I do want to bring up one thing, and I'm going to be very careful because I don't want to uh, teach pilot. I don't want my wife mad at me. But uh, do you guys remember this? Yes. Remember when we did the, the thousand acts of kindness vow? And uh, for a revolution? And <clears throat> with some of the things on here, we talk about perform acts of kindness and tell people this is an act of revolution against the apathy of the world, to shop at Christian businesses, don't shop at Christophobic businesses or businesses that openly support issues against the word of God, say the name of Jesus in public, recruit people to our cause, turn off mu music, movies, or TV shows that denigrate or dishonor the things of God or Christians, make sure people around you know what you stand for, turn your faith and prayers outward and not just inward. Those were the thousand acts of revolution that we could do. And then we had some revolution confessions. There were four of them that we... Uh, that we talked about. This has been, I was, trying, I was asking Sheila, because she's the one that printed these up, and then I had taught on this, and I couldn't remember how long it's been. It's been a few years now, I think, right? Two or three years, somewhere along those lines. I know it was before the last election, so, uh, but the four revolution confessions that we had, is the first one, my eyes will see abortion outlawed everywhere, my eyes will see America return to God. My eyes will see the church unified. My eyes will see signs and wonders done by my hands. We have seen the first step taken in achieving that first revolution confession this week. So that, I don't care what your politics are, I'm not going to get into all the, the details of that, but what? Yeah, I'm on. The, did you turn up the recording volume? Let's try it now. Looking good? Okay. Well, I didn't get recorded anyway, so just you can be thankful for that we've taken the first step towards the outlawing of abortion. And that is a praise. Amen? Um, I'll leave, leave you guys to enjoin your Facebook debates over <laughs> what happened this week. To your heart's desire. I've had several frustrating conversations this week. Um, although you'd be very proud of me, done very level headed, no yelling back and forth. I didn't use the caps button once. <laughs> so, but that's important. This is, this is something we've been believing for years now that we would see that happen. I believe that it will happen in my lifetime. I've told you guys before my unique association with that Supreme Court decision was that that decision came down about the time that I was conceived. Um, so I'm the first generation born underneath uh, Roe v. Wade. So my whole life has been underneath that law and we're going to see it come down. Amen? Amen. Amen. All right. That's all. I, that was my praise for this week. I was back there when you were asking about it and I remembered this. So Today we're going to kind of piggyback off where Pastor Bob went last week. So go to Acts 13. <coughs> and uh, verse 22. And that says, And when he had removed him, he raised up for them David as king, to whom he also gave testimony and said, I have found David the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart, who will do all my will. Uh, Pastor Bob got into this a lot last week about David being a man after God's own heart. And there were some other things that, that I've noticed in David that I thought would be good to bring up. And I think it's timely because of the world we live in and just, you know, the state of things in the church. And, and just a reminder of what kind of person. Now, David was a man, so when this is a man after God's own heart, we understand that women can be after God's own heart too, right? Pastor Joe had an interesting take on the state of women this morning. <laughs> who, who you'll have to go on his Facebook and, and read it because I didn't put it on mine, and uh, and then you can go from there. Uh, but women can be after God's own heart too. You don't have to be a man, Carly. You can still be a girl and be a person after God's own heart. And uh, 
I believe David shows five attributes that, uh, that we can emulate. There are five attributes to his nature and his character that I believe we can emulate. Other than what Pastor Bob talked about last night, about the, the ability to recognize his own sin, to admit it, to ask forgiveness for it, and to move on. Amen? Uh, the first attribute of David I want to talk about was the fact that he was a shepherd. That was what he... We're introduced to David. That's who he is. In 1 Samuel 16... If you'll go there, please. Verse 11. And it, it talks... Uh, let's just pick. And Samuel said to Jesse, Are all the young men here? Then he said, There remains yet the youngest, and there he is, keeping the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, Send and bring him, for we will not sit down till he comes. So this is when Samuel has come to the house of Jesse to search for someone to anoint as the next king of Israel. And he goes through all of Jesse's sons until he gets to David, the youngest one, who was out tending the sheep. He was responsible for the sheep. If we look further on in the story, we know that he, uh, if we read between the lines right there, now you have to understand something. Samuel was the closest thing to a celebrity that you would have had at this point in time in Israel. He was the prophet of Israel. Everybody knew who he was. And the fact that the prophet came to David's house and he didn't, I mean, imagine if, what's a safe celebrity I can say that's not going to ignite some kind of flame war? Uh, who's a safe celebrity? Tim Tebow. Tim Tebow, yeah. Okay. <laughs> You're out doing your job at home. Let's say your job is, I don't know, mowing the lawn. You're out mowing along because that's your job and you're, you're a good kid and you're trying to do your job and you hear or see that Tim Tebow has showed up at your house. What is your first inclination going to be? Turn the mower off, go inside. What would you say? <laughs> Cry. See, I knew we were going to get something from somebody. There is no safe celebrity. <laughs> you find out that Tim Tebow is at your house, you're going to run inside because you want to see Tim Tebow, right? The lawn can wait. I know it's my family. I can't even say anything really, really, really bad. It's, I'm getting heckled from the back row. <laughs> but you, you, you'd be interested in going. David didn't leave the sheep when he found out that Samuel was at his house looking for the next king. He stayed with the sheep. He stuck with what he was supposed to do. He was steadfast to what he was supposed to do. If uh, flip over to Samuel, First Samuel 17, verse 15. Now we find this is after David has been anointed. This is after he knows he is going to be king of Israel. And uh, in 1750 it says, but David occasionally went. Okay, I, I skipped a the story there. David gets asked to Saul, the king. I, I skipped over a bunch of story. I apologize. Let's back up for a second. Let me fill you in with where we're at. Saul was being troubled by an oppressing spirit that would come to him. Saul had rejected God. Saul was on his own. Um, the anointing had left him because the anointing had been placed on David. So Saul was being tormented by an oppressing spirit, and he could not get any relief. So they sought out someone who could play an instrument that could sort of soothe these dark moods that would come on Saul. And they saw somebody knew David played the harp. So they got David. Now David was called to play for Saul, and because the anointing was on him, his playing of the harp was able to soothe this oppressive spirit away from Saul so that he could have some peace. So David became a very important person in the government of Israel way before he was king. And even during that, we see here in 1715, it says, But David occasionally went and returned from Saul to feed his father's sheep at Bethlehem. So even when he had had promotion of a sense, he still never forgot what he was, where he was, and where his responsibilities lay. It would have been easy for him to say, uh, Yeah, I'm done with the whole sheep herding thing. I'm the musician for the king now. I'm above that. I'm too good for that. That's not what he did. He stayed true to who he was and to what he, where he was supposed to be. He was steadfast in where he was called to do. <clears throat> he went back to them after he was Saul's armor bearer. First Samuel, uh, I want you to look in, uh, flip back a couple chapters to chapter, or back one chapter to chapter 16 again, and we are going to look at verse 18. 
Then one of the servants answered and said, Look, I have seen the son of Jesse, the Bethlehemite, who is skillful in playing, a mighty man of valor, a man of war, prudent in speech, and a handsome person, and the Lord is with him. And uh, so before Saul ever killed Goliath, he had a reputation. What did I say? Saul, I meant David. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so before David ever killed Goliath, he had a reputation already. This was when they were looking for somebody to soothe King Saul, and they said, look what they said about him. They said that he is skillful in playing, a mighty man of valor, a man of war, prudent in speech, and a handsome person. I mean, they could have been talking about me. This is why I relate to this so well, because it's like looking in a mirror. I can't get an amen from my wife on that. Not even the person, flesh of my flesh. And she's just back there like this. No. <laughs> what? I thought you said something about old. I was like, <laughs> that too. Yeah, I knew that was coming. I said it right up. But he was called a man of valor and a man of war before he ever faced Goliath. Why is that? We find out David tells us why he has that reputation. If you jump back to chapter 17 and you look at verse 34, it says, But David said to Saul, Your servant used to keep his father's sheep, and when a lion or a bear came and took a lamb out of the flock, I went out after it and struck it and delivered the lamb from its mouth. And when it rose against me, I caught it by its beard and struck it and killed it. I love this, these two verses. There's a whole lot in these two verses to tell you about David. You guys have heard me preach that I, got, I had a lot of fun because Dad was sitting right here in the front row and went up and grabbed him by the beard. David went up to a bear and a lion, and when they rose up against him again, he grabbed it by the beard and punched it to death. That's what it's saying. I'd be afraid to drag, <laughs> grab a cat by the beard and try to punch it to death. Good. <laughs> This is going to be a long day if you guys are going to be like this <laughs> the whole time. I will preach two hours. <laughs> but he was a man of valor. He had a reputation. And it, was, it stemmed from him being proficient in where he was originally called. If he had had his eyes on some other prize while he was being a shepherd, he wouldn't have risked himself against a lion and a bear because he was destined for bigger things. Does that make sense? But because he was steadfast, because he was reliable in where he had been positioned, the things that came against him couldn't stop him from what was his destiny somewhere else. It's real easy for us sometimes to think, um, to, to have the picture of where we're going to be and to know that we're called for something and to know that we have, there's plans for us that are not where we're at right now and leave us to neglect where we are because we're looking too far down the road and trying to put ourselves where we're supposed to be then, now. Does that make sense? And we neglect. What does the Bible tell us? The Word says that if you're faithful over a few, I'll make you ruler over many. Too many times we see that I'll make you ruler over many and start focusing on the ruler over many and forget to be faithful over the few. And that can lead us to trouble. <clears throat> Second attribute of David that... Uh, that's right, is he was a warrior. We know his story of Goliath, uh, verse Samuel 17, chapter 17, we're going to look at verse 40. It says, uh, when he took his staff in his hand and he chose for himself five smooth stones from the brook and put them in a shepherd's bag in a pouch which he had and his sling was in his hand and he drew near to the Philistine. So the Philistine came and began drawing near to David and the man who bore the shield went before him. And when the Philistine looked about and saw David, he disdained him for he was only a youth, ruddy and good looking. When your enemies think you're good looking, you're good looking. <laughs> you notice how many times the Bible tells us that David was good looking? He must have been good looking. So when I see myself in the Word, and it says good looking, and there it is. Thank you. I finally. I threw that line out in the water like 18 times, <laughs> just waiting for a nibble. And finally got one. So the Philistine said to David, Am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. And the Philistine said to David, Come to me, and I will give your flesh to the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. Then David said to the Philistine, You come to me with a sword and a spear and a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand, 
and I will strike you and take your head from you. And this day I will give the carcasses of the camp of the Philistines to the birds of the air and the wild beasts of the earth, and that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. That is some serious trash talk going on on that field between Goliath and David. And David definitely was not intimidated by the threats that Goliath made. Goliath was, by what our accounts are, over nine feet tall. Basically, his head would have been brushing up close to that ceiling right there. Not far from it. And proportioned, too. He wasn't, you know, like Manute Bowl. How many remember who Manute Bowl was? Nobody, probably. He was an NBA player who was seven foot seven, but he was skin and bone. But Goliath was a big man. He was a giant. He had giant blood in him. And he would have been intimidating to look at. And David was not scared. Goliath says, I'm going to feed you to the birds. And David said, you're wrong. I'm going to chop your head off and feed your whole army to the birds. So you got to give it up for good looking David. Then all this assembly shall know that the Lord does not save with sword and spear for the battle is the Lord's and he will give you into our hands. So it was, verse 48, when the Philistines arose, when the Philistine arose and came near to meet David, that David hurried and ran toward the army to meet the Philistine. Then David put his hand in his bag and took out a stone and he slung it and struck the Philistine in the forehead so that the stone sank into his forehead and he fell on his face to the earth. Now, I've taught this before, but I'll bring it up again just to have it in your memory. Uh, I love this little verse here because hidden in there is something that I think is really cool in the way that I see it, in the way that I read it. And remember, you guys know who I am. I believe this story actually happened. I believe that David ran towards Goliath, put a rock in a sling, swung it, hit Goliath in the forehead. The rock went, hit him so hard that it stuck in his forehead and Goliath fell forward onto his face. Now, how many times, how many times have you ever been hit in the face with something? A lot. Right? Do you, when you get hit with a great force in the front of your face, what direction do you generally move? Backwards. So he got hit in the forehead with a rock, and it hit him so hard that it lodged in his forehead, but he fell forward. Because I believe <laughs> that because of Goliath's mouth, that the David's angel was right behind him, and as soon as that thing hit David, that angel kicked Goliath in the back of the head and said, you will kneel before the God of Israel. And so that's why Goliath fell forward on his face. That's how I read it. It's not in the word, <laughs> but in my head, I see that he's going to kneel one way or another. Every knee shall bow, and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. And I believe that's what happened there. You take that for what you want where you will. Verse 50 says, So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone and struck the Philistine and killed him, but there was no sword in the hand of David. Therefore David ran and stood over the Philistine, took his sword, drew it out of its sheath, and killed him and cut his head off with it. And when the Philistines saw that their champion was dead, they fled. David took Goliath's head exactly how he said he would. Then he went and once he, the Philistines saw that their champion had been beheaded, they ran. Now, we're not going to take the time to read through the rest of the story, but the, the, Philist, the Israelites chased them, took them, destroyed them, came back, took all their stuff, took all the spoils. And it was all because David was not intimidated by a, uh, an obstacle that looked bigger than him. He had a warrior mentality. David was a, a, a cunning and skilled warrior. We know that David, the chant that got David into Saul's bad graces was Saul slain his thousands, David has slain his tens of thousands. We can go through other places in Samuel and read some accounts. He, he went through and beat this army. He went through and beat that army. Uh, one that I thought was interesting that just, because again, you guys know me, I like weird stuff. So go to Sam, 1 Samuel 18 and we're going to pick it up in verse 25. Uh, Well, let's look at 23. So Saul's servants spoke those words in the hearing of David, and David said, Does it seem to you a light thing to be a king's son-in-law, seeing I am poor and lightly esteemed man? If you remember back in Goliath, we didn't talk about this, but one of the, the prizes, Pastor Bob brought it up last week, was that one of the prizes for whoever would slay Goliath would be the, the king's daughter as, as their wife. And the servants of Saul told him, saying, In this manner David spoke. <coughs> now here's where... 
Society has drastically changed. Coming up. Then Saul said, Thus you shall say to David, The king does not desire any dowry, but one hundred foreskins of the Philistines, to take vengeance on the king's enemies. But Saul thought to make David fall by the hand of the Philistines. So when his servant told David these words, it pleased David well to become the king's son-in-law. Now the days had not expired. So instead of a dowry, which is something we don't do anymore anyway, a dow how many of you know what a dowry, do you guys know what a dowry was? A dowry was, if a woman wanted to get married, her family had to pay the man to marry her. So, sounds like a good deal to me, but I'm on the wrong side of that whole equation, so you probably can't take my word. Uh, but David didn't have a dowry because he wasn't rich. So Saul, seeking to have David killed, said, well, told David to go get 100 foreskins of the Philistines. So, <laughs> it's not exactly what you would think of as a wedding present. Right? Or an engagement gift. Here, honey, look what I got you. You guys are quiet today. 27... Verse 27, Therefore David arose and went, he and his men, and killed 200 men of the Philistines. And David brought their foreskins, and they gave them in full count to the king, that he might become the king's son-in-law. Then Saul gave him Michael, as his, da his daughter, as a wife. So David goes above and beyond. Now again, I read this story, and I believe it actually happened. I'm hoping, for the Philistines' sake, they were dead before he took their foreskins. Just out of the kindness of my heart, I hope that he killed them first and then took their foreskins. It's a whole other different story if he's got to chase down 200 Philistines to take their foreskins while they're going to be actively resisting him. <laughs> As anybody would be actively resisting that procedure at that age with no anesthesia. So, David was a warrior. Amen? Come on. Amen. All right. You guys are stone silent today. Was it the foreskins? Is that what did it? <laughs> That's what threw you off. Okay. All right. Third attribute of David was <laughs> he was a poet and a musician. We know that David wrote the majority of the Psalms. Those were songs. David had an artistic spirit to him. We know that we've already talked about how he was brought in to play the harp to soothe the spirit the, the oppressive spirit that would come on Saul and would oppress him and would, would drive him to these dark places. David had the ability to do that. He, uh, many of the Psalms are full of raw emotion. You know, we, we've read them so many times and we've read them in King James English and they've become almost, you know, they have like a, like a Shakespearean flavor to them because they sound in, they're, they're, they're structured in words that we don't use anymore and in patterns that we don't necessarily use anymore. But these were, these were the crying out of his heart from almost like a, a, just a raw emotional place. Even like the famous ones, like the 23rd Psalm, that most of us can probably recite. <coughs> you know, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Though it's coming from a place of, of, like, of just intense feeling. And he wasn't afraid of expressing his feelings. He wasn't afraid to show a deeply personal, intimate side to him. He's, you know, he, we, a lot of his psalms, like, he talks about how his enemies surround him, and he, he's being overtaken. But he always comes back to the fact that God is his deliverer, that, that God is his rock, and they, they reveal uh, his affirmations of his faith in God. They, uh, they, they, they place demands on the promises of God. David placed demands on God's, places demands on God a lot in the psalms. You said, you are, those sort of things. Those are David putting God to his word before he had the Holy Spirit to lead him that way. Before he had the Bible to go back and flip through and see, oh yeah, see it was right there. Amen? David called out the attributes of God from a place of emotion and he was able to do it expressing his feelings in a way that he was unashamed about them. He was unashamed to admit when he felt weak. He was unashamed to admit that he needed God as his rock. See now, <coughs> the wrong kind of masculinity will say, well, I don't need anybody. The wrong kind of self-reliance will teach that, well, I don't need anybody's help. I can do this on my own. Amen? David did not fall into that trap. He understood that he needed God. That he needed to have God as his rock, as his support, 
as his strong tower, as his place in time of need, his refuge, a place where he could rest in the shadow of his wings. He needed that, and he wasn't afraid to express that need. A lot, you could call, say that a lot of them were love letters to God. He had that kind of relationship that came from him being in touch with that side of his personality. The fourth attribute of David that uh, struck me is he became king. Remember, we're talking about the attributes of David. David was called a man after God's own heart. And we're just going through some attributes of him. David united the divided kingdoms of Israel and Judah. He finished the job that Saul started. Uh, David laid the groundwork for the prosperous years that would come to Solomon. Amen? We know that Solomon's prosperity stemmed from his, his willingness to ask God for wisdom rather than riches. But all that that he had was laid upon a foundation that David had built. <clears throat> and the fifth aspect of King David is that he was a father. Now David was not a perfect father. Uh, there are some lessons to be learned there. Um, for one thing, Solomon, we know Solomon... Uh, Solomon was of Bathsheba, who Bathsheba was a betrayal of David's family. And if you go to 2 Samuel 12, 2 Samuel 12, and we're going to look at verse 9, it says, uh, Why have you despised, despised the commandment of the Lord to do evil in his sight? You have killed Uriah the Hittite with the sword. You have taken his wife to be your wife and have killed him with the sword of the people of Ammon. Now therefore the sword shall never depart from your house because you have despised me and have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. Thus says the Lord, I will raise up adversity against you from your own house and I will take your wives before your eyes and give them to your neighbor and he shall lie with your wives in the sight of the sun. Part of David's punishment for his sin that he committed with Bathsheba was there was going to be strife in his house and we know that that came to pass. Uh, his sons all schemed for the throne. Absalom, of course, being the most famous, but he had strife throughout his house. Absalom wanted to kill people that were, there were, there were also children of David. He had, some of his sons were in open rebellion against him. Absalom led a rebellion, tried to, called himself king in part of Judah. That would be brutal. It's tough when, I mean, when your sons don't, you know, don't praise you all the time. You know, that can be a little rough. You know, it's, it's, it can be bad. You know, they'll just make fun of you sometimes or, you know, say, that's why you have no friends. And uh, <laughs> we need to... So. That's bad enough. <laughs> It'd be even worse if they just sat up and tried to kill you <laughs> and went to actual war against you. That would be a little bit more difficult. Uh, but David did love his children. He loved them very much. In fact, he loved Absalom so much, he let him go as long as it was possible before his general actually determined that Absalom had. David never wanted Absalom to die. He never wanted to see him fall. He was heartbroken when Absalom died. It wrecked him. He was heartbroken when the first child between him and he and Bathsheba died. He prayed and fasted for days for that punishment to pass, and it didn't. But David loved his children. So what do we take from these attributes? We're going to get you out of here a little bit early today, I think. Don't hold me to that just yet, because we're getting to the really fun part in a second. But Well, fun for me. I've learned with you all that what I think is fun is not always... <laughs> What everybody else thinks is fun or interesting. <laughs> Go ahead, bring it on. I can take it. Uh, the, the <laughs> That's why I have no friends. Uh, <laughs> <coughs> we can emulate these attributes in our lives. To, there, there are things about David that we, can, that we can take and we can put into practice in our lives. Uh, the, the she, his shepherd spirit. Uh, as parents, and as people who will someday be parents, or as grandparents, or as aunts and uncles, anybody who has in, influence on the next generations is, uh, as a parent especially, to shepherd our children. To know that no matter what calling God's placed on our lives, our families are still our first priority. Amen? It is no, God knows where your responsibilities are as a parent. And I know most, there's you know, very few parents with children that are still young in here right now. So Aaron, I'm basically preaching to you and pass the grandparents along. And, and the other, anybody else who have young, none of us, nobody else has young kids still. So Aaron... <coughs> 
Do not let your ambition, Aaron, lead to their neglect. I have to preach right to you. because you know, <laughs> Even for the things of God. And it's important for all of us, though, to remember where, the, the, to, to reinforce those, uh, those responsibilities in places that we can. I was planning on Jeff and Sarah being here, too, and there was going to be maybe even Dan or Ashley, and there's going to be others here that had young kids. This is really going to be a good, good point. I know I, I mentioned Carly doesn't have kids. I know we have young ones here, too, that are young ones here. I said them. I mentioned them. Maybe if you weren't busy heckling me from the back and paying attention, you would have caught that. <laughs> I thought, oh, well, I just wanted to pick on Aaron. So, uh, A part of being a shepherd, though, is to remember the responsibilities where God has placed you. To remember, if God has called you to do a certain thing, it's not always the place you're going to stay. But while you're there, take care of your flock. Whatever your flock is in that case. You know, if your flock is, well, for example, uh, I don't think God has called anybody to be permanent janitors in the kingdom of God. But he has called us to have a servant's heart. So like when we sign up for the every month for cleaning the church, Maybe you're called to do something else with your life. Maybe you're called to some other kind of ministry. But when you're filling in in your position to clean the church that month, that needs to take responsibility. What? I have forgot. We have forgotten. You didn't have to know about that until the, the, you know, the, the peanut gallery popped up back there. But <laughs> we could have gotten away with it. No, because Danny and Danita always know. You don't get away with it. They know. They know when you've missed your turn. <laughs> but understand that when God has placed you in one spot to be a shepherd over that thing, to be a shepherd, to be faithful over that. That's what David was. David was faithful over where he was at, even though God had called him to something else. So you could be called to be, you know, a missionary, to go out and save an entire continent. But if God has placed you in a place where you are in charge of vacuuming the sanctuary, don't let the call that's on the future part of your life diminish your uh, responsibility for where he's called you out in that exact moment. Does that make sense? All right, we can move on. Uh, a shepherd protects against all enemies, even the ones that scare you. Uh, again, it goes more towards parenting, but, you know, just to be able to protect, don't let any of the enemies that would scare you because God will, or not God, the, the enemy will use your insecurities against you in, to, to those that are in your charge. All right, I'll just leave that there. We'll, we'll move on. Two, that attribute, a warrior attribute, you have to teach your children to be victorious. The world will teach them how to be defeated. Now that goes even for spiritual children. The world is waiting at the door to teach the next generation, to teach new believers, to teach children, young adults, anybody, how to be defeated. It will teach them how to lose. We need to teach them how to be victorious. Because outside, you'll lose more than you'll win all the time. Here's where I'm going to lose some of you. <laughs> I already know it. Sometimes... You have to fight. I, uh, I posted a meme. What are you giggling about? I posted a meme. Huh? The kids. The kids. So. I posted a meme the other day that was a quote from an actor. And <laughs> you, some of you are not going to agree with me on this one. Um, but it said that if your kid is bullying my kid and my kid has told your kid to stop, and your kid does not stop, my kid has been instructed to punch your kid in the face. Amen. And I know this is where I lose some of you. So this is not... <laughs> Sometimes you have to fight. I was bullied. So I take... This is all from my own personal experience. I was bullied from the time I was in kindergarten in various forms up until the time I was a freshman or sophomore in high school. I experienced different bullying at different places. And Joey's back there laughing at me. That's why I have no friends. <laughs> when I was in kindergarten, 
I was bullied by a sixth grade boy who was constantly physically abusive to me and uh, I had been bullied at other times. Um, when I was in eighth grade, I was severe. I was beaten up several times by uh, bigger boys who were freshmen, sophomore in high school. Um, I was threatened to get beaten with nunchucks one time, uh, which seems ridiculous now, but in eighth grade, I thought that was the end. I thought it was over. It's been a good run. But I was, I was bullied. I, was, uh, I faced a lot of physical bullying. And there's... <laughs> It's easy to j- l- l- uh, joke about it now and laugh about it now, but at the time, man, it was it was rough, man. It, it, I, it affected a good portion of my life in a negative way uh, because I was afraid. I was scared, and I didn't fight back to defend myself because I was afraid and because I was scared. And that wrecked my self-esteem for a long time. Um, and it really... Uh, impacted how I viewed myself as a man. Um, I, and as a young adult, I exhibited a lot of very self-destructive, dangerous behavior to get past that feeling that I was somehow not enough of a man because of what I experienced as a kid. Um, I got myself, I have scars on my body from that type of living. I have put you know, myself in jeopardy and in danger to try to prove my masculinity because as a child it was challenged and I felt like a sissy because I didn't stand up for myself and so it, it, it affected me and there's not any time I think about it at 40 almost 45 years old even now every time I think back and think about it or remember it I still have an over dying wish that I would have just stuck up for myself once and so when i say something along those lines like and that's what I've told my kids I've told Joey that before and I'll tell Dante and Zeke the same thing if somebody's bullying you defend yourself if it's that's not stopped I'm not saying that should be your first the first time somebody says something mean to you you lay them out because that's not the right answer either but there is sometimes a point you get to where you have to fight and I wish I had done that I think it would have drastically changed what I consider now to be the history of my life if I had one time stood up for myself. And uh, not to go too deep into all of that, you know, I don't want to spill my whole life story in front of you. Most of you know me long enough to know good portions of it anyway, but that was, I consider to be one of the most dominant influences in my entire life was the fact that I was bullied so many different times over the course of my childhood. And so uh, it's, <clears throat> it's important to remember that simply because um, there may be other options. And I know a lot of people say that uh, violence never solved anything. Um, Well, we'll get to that. But uh, I lost where I was at there. Sometimes you do have to fight. Abraham fought for Lot. When Lot was in danger, when Lot had been... uh, Abraham took an army to free Lot. David was called to fight countless battles. He was called to fight Goliath. He threw a rock at him and then cut his head off. That's fighting. Fighting well. (laughs) Right? Uh, Even Jesus got violent. Amen? We know the story. He went through and cleared the temple. He took a whip and went through and cleared the temple. Why did he do that? He did it because the people there were trying to change the dwelling place of God into something that it wasn't. He said, this, my, the, 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 the word says, my house shall be a house of prayer. You've made it into a den of thieves. They were trying to change something, the dwelling of God, the dwelling place of God, into something that it wasn't. Anytime the enemy tries to change the dwelling place of God into something it wasn't, the word of God got violent. He responded with violence to an enemy changing the dwelling place of God from what it was supposed to be into something that it wasn't. He responded with violence. Now, I don't think Jesus stood there and whipped the people into a bloody pulp. I think he chased them out. He got violent and he chased them out. He said he wouldn't allow, one one account of the gospel says he wouldn't allow anybody to do more business in there that day. 
So that doesn't mean he just ran through there once, scared everybody. Whoa, some guy's knocking all the tables over, and, and then they went back to business as usual. He stayed there, stood his ground, and said, you will not do this. Is this contradictory to turn any other cheek? I don't believe it is. Because when we see in the stories, the, 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 the parable that Jesus, when Jesus talks about that, turning the other cheek, he says, if a man strikes you, turn the other cheek. If he sues you and takes your coat, Give him your cloak or your tunic also. If he asks you to go one mile, instead go two. None of those actions were trying to change what that person was. So in those instances, it was Jesus was teaching to turn the other cheek. But he gives us an example of when the enemy tries to change the dwelling place of God into something that it is not, violence sometimes is needed. So when the enemy is trying to change you, the dwelling place of God into something you're not, violence can be called for. This is how I justify my position on bullying with the word, because I don't want to be off base with what I teach my kids as far as word. But what bully is trying to change the dwelling place of God into something that it is not. It is trying to say that you're worthless, that you're powerless. They're trying to say that you have no importance, that you are weak, that you are less than they are. That is, and that is the message, I can tell you from experience, that is the message that is received when you are bullied. That is the message that I received when I was bullied, that I was less than them, that I was not uh, worth standing up for myself. I felt belittled, humiliated. Those things do not have a right to reside in the dwelling place of God. I am the, the, the temple of the Holy Spirit. I am the dwelling place of God. So when those things are tried to put on the tried to be put upon the dwelling place of God, I believe that violence is an acceptable answer. Now I'm gonna try to bring all of you that I lost back in. Some of you are very politely nodding, you know. Yes, I hear you're seeing. I hear what you're saying. It's not how I see it. I understand. That's just how I see it. They were trying to devalue the worth of the temple, so Jesus responded. Uh, the world is trying to... This is where I'm going to talk to just kind of the guys in the room for a second. Um, there's been different times I've talked to just the ladies in the room. So it's fair and balanced and equal. All right? <laughs> the world is attempting, and we know this, the world is attempting to demasculinize men, to take away those attributes of men that God uses in his kingdom. Men and women... i got a newsflash for you. Men and women are different. And the, the, the thought police are on their way to arrest me. I'll be taken away for re-education <laughs> in the Ministry of Truth, which is a 1984 reference, and someday I'll get all of you guys to read that book, so when I make these references, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, one of my favorite books of all time. Aggression is now a sign of a problem. Any aggression any roughhouse and horseplay is a sign of toxic masculinity, which is my least favorite New Age term out there. Toxic masculinity. Anytime a guy acts like a guy, it is toxic masculinity. Toxic masculinity. Basically, anything that makes a man a man is toxic masculinity and must be shunned because it's detrimental to society at large. Anytime the world starts a trend, don't trust it. Now, I talked a little bit about bullying, and uh, you would think that I'd be front and center of the secular world's push against bullying. I am not. I'm not, because it relies on, here's where it can lead to. The, the, their definition of bullying is basically anytime you disagree with somebody, you're bullying them. And I do not. I'm not ride or die with that at all in any way because what it's going to be it's why I'm against hate speech laws hate crime laws there are some hateful people out there there are people out there who still think it's cool to be a Nazi for God's sake <laughs> what kind of an idiot looks at history and says oh yeah those are the people I want to be <laughs> out of all the people in history there are people out there that pick Nazis I mean, they're stupid, and then there's dumb stupid. <laughs> and they have crossed a line. Anybody who aligns themselves in any way with the Nazis 
That's, that's, they've, they've gone off the rails. They got thrown out of the stupid tree, hit every branch on the way down, reclimbed it, and fell again. It's dumb. There is real hate in the world. The Nazis were the best example we've ever had on earth of what real evil and real hate look like. And there are still people that want to be them. So don't get me wrong. I believe that there, are, there is hate out there. There are people who are hateful. There are people out there who hate people because they're black. There are people out there who hate people because they're Asian. Because they're Hispanic. Because they're white. Because they're island. Because they're Native American. It doesn't, there are people out there who hate with everything inside them, anything that's different from them in any way. So I understand that there's hate out there, and there's hateful speech. There are words you should not have in your mouth, ever. And I believe in free speech. I am a free speech advocate, but there is zero chance that I'm going to say it's okay to say certain things that are hateful. Well, you know what the hateful words are. Don't look at me like you don't. You know exactly what words I'm talking about. I'm not, not going to talk me into saying them right now. We're not doing that, huh? This is why I have no friends. <laughs> I know all the hateful words. But hate speech, I don't support hate speech violations and hate crimes. Why? Because those things are, for one thing, they originated in the secular world, and so I don't trust it. The same with the anti-bullying campaign that's originated in the secular world, I don't trust it because there are ulterior motives. Because, let me ask you this, it's one thing to say I hate you because you are, insert whatever thing the person has decided to hate. And so, yes, that sounds hateful, that sounds horrible, that sounds terrible. But it's, it's benign in a sense of there's no, no consequences to them for your hate. But here's where I have a problem with hate speech laws and bullying laws. Because, <laughs> now stay with me for a second, okay? It's a twisty little turn, but I can get you there if you'll stay with me. What could be more, in the world's eyes, what could be more hateful than to say to someone, do as I say, think how I think, or you will spend an eternity in torment. You understand where that, see how that goes? See how quickly and easily that gets turned? Any type of proselytizing speech would become hate speech. Because you're saying, what, what you're saying that if I don't believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and that He died for our sins, and that God raised Him from the dead, I'm going to hell? That's exactly what we're saying. That's exactly what the Word teaches. And yet, bullying and hate speech laws, anti-bullying campaigns and hate speech laws will pick on that and say that that is hate speech and it will be outlawed. Any teaching that there is a right and moral way to live your life in all aspects will become hate speech because it will by, necess uh, by necessity teach that there is immoral ways to act and to live your life. And that to the people who are in that camp saying that there is something as moral and immoral is dividing them and making them and othering them. Have you heard that phrase before? Othering makes them feel like they're other, that they're outside. So, this is why I don't, un okay, maybe you haven't. I spend way too much time on the internet. That's why I have no friends. And so, but the, the reason why I don't support these anti-bullying campaigns is because they will make the gospel of Jesus hate speech. They will make it bullying for you to say that I believe the Bible says this about how you're supposed to live your life and that if you live your life outside of that way that the Bible says to live your life that you are not that you are in, in you are living in sin you are acting in sin you have an immoral life because now what what do you do when you go into to a place where your views are the minority where I mean most of the world has, has totally dismissed the idea of moral and immoral Unless, I mean, okay, I'm not, well, I'm not supposed to talk about politics, so I'll stay out of there. Get me, cash me up outside and we'll talk about it, okay? Yeah. <laughs> they got it. Nobody else got it. <laughs> the notion of nonviolence has been distorted to say that you should always be passive. Now, understand that not every time when you're called to fight, you're going to have to go out and you know, ball up your fist and pretend to be Conor McGregor. Okay? Especially since he just got whooped last night, so that's probably a bad, I just remembered that that's probably a bad example 
Uh, how many of you, raise your hands if you know who Conor McGregor is? Not very many. Okay. Okay. He's, a, he's an MMA fighter, and he got, he got handled pretty well last night, and there was a brawl. But not every time you have to go out there with your fists or with a gun or with a knife or a spear, if that's the way you still roll. Uh, <coughs> but this idea that you're supposed to be passive in order to, to be uh, nonviolent is, is, is a distortion. The, bo the body of Christ has often forgotten how to fight. Because we're so, we, we, we've had this notion of turning the other cheek that we've we extended to where, places where it doesn't belong. We are called to fight. Now, I'm not saying, like I said, you're going to have to go out there and, and, you know, arm yourself to the teeth or whatever, but you're supposed to fight. You're supposed to stand your ground, to make your stand and stay there no matter what comes against you. Remember, to, a lot God word that we've been assured victory. God fights the battle, but we have to show up prepared to fight. We have to make our stand. Now, fighting isn't always, like I said, punching or whatever. Sometimes fighting is just saying, no, that's not right, and I'm standing here, and I'm going to affirm that that's not right. You have to fight for what you believe in, is what I'm saying. You understand what that means? Amen? You have to look at me like, you have the, the, like I'm, <laughs> the, uh, I'm getting weird looks. So, What? I'm not speaking gibberish. Wow, it's brutal today. Brutal today. The other aspect of David, the other aspect of David, uh, poet, uh, poet and musician, um, you don't have to be a poet, but you do have to learn how to express your feelings about God in order to convey them to somebody else. Uh, as a parent, don't let your kids think your only emotion is anger. That's good parenting advice for me. <laughs> I don't know if it applies to anybody else, but making sure that my kids see different emotions besides anger is important um, because my kids can make me angry. I'm sure that I have received some unjust allotment in life because I know that not once ever did I make my parents angry at me so the fact that I, my kids make me angry is one of life's great injustices. Because I was a perfect little angel that never did anything wrong. <laughs> that never did anything wrong. So the fact that I've been unduly hit <laughs> with this aspect of life is a travesty. <laughs> My parents aren't here. My mom, she said, I hope your kids act just like you did. And she did it. And it worked. And it's not fair. <laughs> it's, your, it's your response to also uh, the aspect of David as a king. We are supposed to be able to teach those that we come into contact with what it means to rule and reign. Like I said, the world will teach them how to lose. We need to teach them how to be victorious, how to rule, and how to reign. Following Christ is the best way to teach them how to lead. Jesus led from the front from day one. He didn't sit, you know, he didn't sit back and be like, okay, now you guys go out and do all the work. He was out there. He was the one preaching. He was the one out there healing the sick, touching the lepers, touching the people who were unclean, calling for the, the thousands to be fed. He, took, he was at the forefront of of his ministry. He walked and he walked and lived every word that he said. And I cannot say that about myself. I can't say that I've walked and lived every word that I've said in relationship to the gospel. I have missed the mark. I've made mistakes. I make mistakes often. I don't try to, but that's what a mistake is. I don't think anybody sets out to make mistakes. Somebody sets out and says, I'm going to do this wrong. I'm going to screw this up just because. If you did that, you would have no friends. Uh, but nobody sets out to be wrong. Teaching them, and this is where I think a lot of church leadership gets into dangerous, not in our church, but I've seen it in, in the church at large, gets into dangerous waters, is too many people want to be like their pastor. 
Too many people want to be like the Christian celebrities that they see. They want to be, and I'm not going to name names because I'm not trying to pin anything on anybody, but too many people want to be like the, the men and women they see on TV. I want to be like this person. Well, that person has flaws too. That person goofs up. That person makes mistakes. Teaching people to emulate, you know, a, a person they see on TV is, gonna, is setting them up for failure. They should emulate Jesus and how he did his ministry. A king doesn't worry about peer pressure. A king doesn't become just another face in the crowd. See, the world wants you to assimilate. There's a nice big word for you. I haven't thrown out a, too lot of, a whole lot of big words today. The world wants you to assimilate. assimilate. Now I can't pronounce it the second time through. <laughs> they want you to conform to what they want. They want you to fit in. I'm, I'm well removed from high school. I was a Several in here that are right in there, that the desire to fit in is strong at that age. And the world tr puts pressure to fit in. Carly can't fit in anywhere. We know that. So <laughs> She's one of a kind. But, we, but we, in, a, in a lesser sense, we all have pressure to fit in, to, go, to get along. To go along, you've got to get along, right? You, wanna, you don't want to make, some people don't want to rock the boat. They just want peace. They just want peace. They want things to be peaceful. I get itchy when things are peaceful. Follow me on Facebook. You'll, you'll, you'll have evidence of that. I'll, I'll be good for a while. Everything's nice and quiet. And then all of a sudden it'll be like, you know what? I just feel like starting a fight today. And so we'll go out and just go on there. And that's what happens. But the world wants you to conform to their idea of what a safe Christian would be. They want you to just be the... <laughs> I could step on somebody's toes. I don't think anybody's here, but they just want you to be like, well, you know what? We're all going to heaven anyway because Jesus died for everybody, so it doesn't matter what you do. We're, you know, uh, that sort of thing. They want you to be a safe... The enemy doesn't care that you're a Christian now. He can't change that. Well, he wants you to be a safe Christian. Safe not to you. Safe not to the people around you. Safe not to your loved ones. Safe to him. He wants you to inflict as much, as least, the least amount of damage on his kingdom as possible. And the, first, the way he does that is he tries to get you to conform to this idea of Shut your mouth. It's not polite to talk about that sort of thing. You don't want to offend anybody. You don't want to make people mad at you. And that's where he silences you and tries to make you into this mold of, of this, you know, generic, never head, never comes above the level of the crowd around you, quiet, make no mark, impact no lives type of a person. That's not who we are. Kings rule. They don't succumb to peer pressure. They set the standard. The king makes the law in a kingdom. King says it. That's the way it is. Ecclesiastes 8 4 says, Where the word of a king is, there is power. And who can say to them, What are you doing? He's like, uh, I'm doing what I'm doing. I'm the king. That's the part that the King James leaves off the end of there. Because it leaves it hanging there. Because it says, The word of a king is, there is power. And who may say to him, What doest thou? Well, that King James started to make you know, sense of that. What doest thou? I've never once in my life asked somebody, what doest thou? <laughs> never. And I've had some people I wonder, what doest thou? <laughs> but it's never come out of my mouth like that. But you see, where a king says something, what that verse is telling you is that nobody has a right to ask him why he's doing it. The world doesn't have, to ask, doesn't have the right to ask you why you believe that God created the heavens and the earth. The world doesn't have a right to ask you why you believe that there is one way to the Father. The world doesn't have to ask you, doesn't have, to, doesn't have the right to ask you why you believe you're healed or why you believe that God has agreed to take care of all of your needs, to supply all of your needs. It doesn't have the right to. Why? You're a king. You said it. That's the way it is. The king doesn't make a decree and then be like, so what do you think of that? No. <laughs> you want to know something even... You're bound by your decree. Look what happened to Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar was the king over Babylon. And he let the wrong influence into him to get in his head, to whisper in his ear, to do something. And he declared that all people would pray, were not allowed to pray to any other god but him, and anybody who broke that law would be thrown into a den of lions. And one of his most trusted advisors broke that law, and the king was bound by his decree. 
See, where the word of a king is, there's power. And who can say to him, what doest thou? David's attribute as a father, um, we can learn from. But the, the, the fatherhood example applies even if you're not a father. Uh, we are examples of God as parents. We're examples of God to our children. As believers, we are the example for what uh, God and Jesus are all about to those who do not know him. So, in this one, I got to just talk to myself. Uh, when my eye uh, plan for getting people who are driving way too slow to speed up in front of me is by getting as close as I can to them safely so they know there's somebody behind them who wants to go faster than they're going right now, it's probably not giving them a good image of what God is like. Right? Right? When I give them that mean look like I would kill you if I thought I could get away with it, when I do finally get around them, <laughs> that's not giving them a good example of what God's like. If I get angry at somebody over something, that's not giving them a good example. If, I, if I'm, a, you know, overly angry or lose my temper with my... I'm not telling myself on this one. Uh, because maybe you can apply it in some aspect to your life. Uh, I've told Dante and Zeke... In my head, it feels like at least a million times. It's probably not that many. It's you know, maybe 800,000 times. Um, <laughs> not to play with the doors. They run and chase each other. They'll try to run to the bathroom and shut the door right behind them so the other can't get there. I've told them over and over and over again not to do that. Because every adult in here knows the danger of that, right? Someone's going to get their hand stuck in the door. Someone's going to get hurt. Well, somebody got hurt. Dante was running to the bathroom and shut the door and it hurt Zeke. I caught him in the head or something and I lost my cool. Lost my cool and yelled at Dante louder than I've ever yelled at him before. And he was visibly shaken. And what I had done in there was give him a negative example of how authority is supposed to operate. And it broke my heart. I... I I don't cry often, but I had, I had tears after that because I lost. I didn't hit him or anything. I, was, I didn't abuse him. I yelled at him, but I scared him is what I'm saying. I scared him. And I don't want my kids to fear me. God doesn't want us to have that kind of fear for him. So because of my actions in a moment of anger, even though it was, it was justified anger because of what I told him would happen, it happened. But because I lost my temper... I gave my son an improper image of how authority is supposed to work. If we are deficient in our example, then our children's view of God will be deficient, or the world's view of God will be deficient. Now, I'm not calling us to say that we have to be perfect. Obviously, we're not we're perfect. Remember what the defining aspect of David was when he was a man after God's own heart, and Pastor Bob talked about that last week, was that ability to recognize error in ourselves and to make the change and to be able to confront the things in us that are not godly and address it admit it and make the change and move on but i know i know i was listening to him teach that last week and i was like so many other things would come to me these aspects of david they could be resident in all of us the aspect of a shepherd taking care of what we've been entrusted to taking care of what's been put in our care being faithful over a few before we're made ruler over many. Then also the, the warrior attitude. That idea that there is nothing that is going to shake us. There is nothing that is going to stop us because we are more than conquerors. And that we have been called to triumph. We've been called to be the head and not the tail. We have been called to fight. You know, I'll come back to this because a lot of people don't like that term fight. But why do you think the Bible gives us even, this is New Testament now, not just Old Testament, the armor of God. You don't wear armor to watch TV. You wear armor to fight. Right? You don't need a helmet, unless people are whipping the remote control around too often. You don't need a helmet to sit there and be passive, to sit there and watch something happen. You don't need a breastplate. You don't need a sword. You don't need a shield, unless you're going out to fight. Okay, I think I beat that one pretty much into the ground, right? My, my feelings on that. But also the aspect of David as being able to 
articulate his emotional connection to God. To be, to have that, that, for lack of better term, an artistic side to you. In whatever way it can be. I can't draw. Okay? I, I have no skill in drawing. It's not a gift I've given. My stick figures don't even look like they're right stick figures. There's something wrong. They look like stick figures that suffered some kind of horrifying accident <laughs> and didn't have good enough insurance to get it fixed right away. So, uh, but now Zeke and Dante both already draw better than me, and I've had a lot more years to practice. It's not a skill I've ever attained. But, you know, it doesn't, just, it doesn't have to be in what we consider to be the arts, but to be able to have that connection, that emotional connection, and not be afraid to articulate it in whatever way you do. Somebody may be able to play piano and articulate that, 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 that feeling that they have towards God. To be a king, to understand that you were called to reign, to rule, and to decree things, not just in this world, but in your own life as well. And also that parenthood, that father type of figure, understanding that the example that we set, we are living epistles, Paul says, read by all men. Basically, people look to us and they're reading the word of God in our lives. Which parts are redacted because of what we're, how we're acting? You know what redacted means? Redacted means omitted, like, they, they, like it's blacked out. What parts of the words of God, what parts, I'm sorry, what parts of the word of God are we blacking out when people read us by the things we do? I saw a, a, a thing that said, you know, love your neighbor. It says, love your neighbor that looks different than you. Love your neighbor that acts different than you. Love your neighbor that thinks different than you. Love your neighbor that votes different than you. Love your neighbor who speaks different than you. Love your neighbor, period, end of story. Which is what Jesus said. He says, love your neighbor. So what parts of the word of God are we blacking out of the book that people are reading when they look at us? What pages have we ripped out of the Bible that people aren't reading, aren't seeing when they look at us? There's several that I need to get taped back in there in my own life. I'm sure that others would say the same thing. That there are parts that nobody's perfect. But when David was called a man after God's own heart, there were these attributes that make up him. And I just wanted to, to kind of add on to what Pastor Bob, because what he taught last week was so good, about how, you know, that it was his willingness to, to, to not only recognize the sin that was in him, but to also accept the forgiveness that came with it. Amen? Did you get anything out of that today? Or was it just for me? All right. Uh, Pastor Bob, we'll be...